Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So, it's my. Uh, it doesn't project in here. It's for the online audience. So it's my pleasure today to introduce Chris Higgins. Uh, Chris is a, a recently tenured associate professor at Colorado School of Mines in their Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, Chris got his uh, BA in chemistry from Harvard, which isn't bad if you can't go to the school down the street. And uh, then he had a real job for a couple of years as a consultant for, for Cadmus. And then he went to Stanford and did both his master's and PhD there in civil and environmental engineering. And then he saw the light and realized he should have gone to Johns Hopkins like Ray and I. <laughs> and did a postdoc there for a couple of years and found out, just like Ray and I, it's a good place to meet your wife, right? That, that is correct. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so he's going to talk about some of the work he's been doing since he's been at the uh, School of Mines. Great. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Bill, for the introduction, and thank you all for uh, showing up on a beautiful Friday afternoon uh, before the, the fall and winter, before the phase change kicks in, I think, right? Uh, um, and thank you for having me up here. I've actually never been to the University of Minnesota, despite knowing several folks over the years and been uh, being very impressed with the, the research that has been done here over the years. Um, and so I'm excited to be here and to get a chance to talk to folks and see the facilities and, and all that sort of thing. Um, and I'm also a little bit nervous talking about fluorochemicals in Minnesota, but uh, that's okay. Uh, hopefully you guys are, are an informed audience. So uh, before I begin, I want to just say a big thank you to um, all the various folks who are involved in this. Uh, I have a, this is the most recent photo of my group, although several folks have graduated, moved on. I didn't put all the names up there. The names I did put on were people who were involved in the research that I'll be presenting. So uh, two master students in particular, uh, Megan McGuire and David Aslini. Uh, one of my PhD students, uh, Jennifer Guelfo, uh, and a number of, of postdocs, and then uh, also collaborators. Um, uh, this, at least part of the, the project that I'm going to be talking about today uh, was very much made possible by uh, both Jennifer Field at Oregon State, uh, David Sedlak and his uh, team at UC Berkeley, and Charles Schaefer uh, at CBNI. So um, most of what I'm going to be talking about today, or pretty much everything I'm going to be talking about today centers around the issue of perfluoroalkyl acids, uh, PFAAs. And, and folks might have heard the term PFCs thrown out. Um, some are used interchangeably in the literature, although PFAAs is, is becoming more and more the, the adopted nomenclature for these compounds. So uh, uh, technically, no. And, but perfluoroalkyl acids is actually more um, uh, uh, specific, because uh, we're talking about perfluoroalkyl uh, uh, structures. Um, so you guys are probably familiar with these. I, I know uh, at least some folks in the room know what Scotchgard is. Uh, and these are, uh, the alkyl acids are fully fluorinated compounds. So all the hydrogens have been replaced with fluorine. And they have the unique property in that it can re repel both oil and water. And uh, either these compounds or their, um, the compounds that are based off this perfluoro alkyl structure have been used in a variety of uh, consumer uh, products, whether it's textiles or paper packaging products. What I'm going to be talking about today is actually their use of these compounds in firefighting foams. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, these compounds have been detected uh, globally around the world, uh, not just in humans, but also in, in wildlife. Um, and I would say when you think about organic chemicals, um, these combine two aspects of organic chemistry that we don't really usually combine. We usually think about organic chemicals that are relatively mobile in the environment. Uh, things like TCE will move readily in groundwater. Uh, but they don't necessarily bioaccumulate. We think about PCBs as things that bioaccumulate. Well, um, despite the fact we're talking about a broad suite of these compounds, uh, some of these compounds are both mobile and bioaccumulative. And so it raises some interesting questions in terms of understanding their fate uh, and movement in the environment. So uh, for people who aren't familiar with these compounds, you might say, well, that doesn't help me understand uh, the structure of these. I'm an or organic chemist, so I like structures. Uh, this is the, perhaps the poster child uh, fluorochemical, perfluorooctane sulfonate, PFOS. Um, the other poster child would be perfluorooctanoate, uh, PFOA. Um, and as you note here, it's got this perfluorinated uh, tail, so no hydrogens here, and this anionic head group. Um, and the, the fluorinated tail is really what gives its oil and water repellency, um, but the, uh, the anionic head group is what really helps um, in terms of its water solubility and, and mobility. And the good news is, uh, is that the carbon-fluorine bond is one of the strongest uh, bonds known. Okay, so you can actually use these things in things like fighting fuel fires. So you can 
use them uh, to put out fuel fires at temperatures where your hydrocarbon-based uh, surfactants would, would readily degrade. The bad news is the carbon fluorine bond is one of the strongest bonds known. So once they're released out there into the environment, they can be um, extremely persistent. So uh, PFAAs um, in particular, uh, when it is truly perfluorinated, um, are thought to be extremely persistent in the environment. There are a couple of indications that there might be some natural processes that could slowly lead to the degradation of these, but they certainly uh, are gonna be around for a very long time once they're released into the environment. So uh, why do we care? Why should you care? Um, well, this is probably the most uh, somewhat controversial, but uh, uh, also high profile study looking at potential effects uh, of these compounds. And it's uh, Philippe Grangin out of Harvard, published a study in JAMA. Uh, and essentially was looking at the levels of these compounds in, uh, in human serum, and he focused on PFOS and PFO, again, the, the poster child, uh, poster children for fluorochemicals, and observed a decreased um, immune response uh, with increasing levels of these compounds in, in human serum. And I'm not a toxicologist. I'm not going to say what, that, uh, you know, what the, the broader implication of that is, uh, but this was not an occupational exposed population. I, I believe they were um, expected to have elevated exposures, um, but they, uh, he at least uh, observed uh, some effects. The good news is, is that um, thanks to the uh, environmental stewardship of, uh, of uh, 3M, I'll be honest, uh, was, the, was the one who really started this, uh, things like PFOS and human blood have been declining. Uh, I think the half-life, Gary or someone can correct me, I think it's about five years in humans, four years, okay, uh, in humans, and so once uh, 3M uh, pulled Scotchgard, uh, at least the C8-based uh, Scotchgard chemistry from the market, the levels in humans started going down. Uh, we can't necessarily say the same thing for PFOA because there are potentially other sources of that uh, um, uh, in terms of human exposure. But the short story is all of us have these chemicals in our blood. Uh, they're relatively easy to measure in human blood. Um, there's, it's an open question as to whether or not they are causing effects, um, although there's been strong evidence, I think, in, in both directions, but they are extremely persistent in the environment. Uh, and so if they are going to cause an effect, uh, they are gonna be around uh, for a long time and have the potential to cause that effect. So what I'm gonna talk about today, I'll give a little bit more introduction to fluorochemicals as they relate to fire training areas. I'll talk uh, really only about one field study where we're looking at um, a particular Air Force base and trying to characterize these compounds at an Air Force base. And I will talk briefly about some, uh, some laboratory-based studies that we did to kind of follow on uh, some of that, um, uh, that field work that we did characterizing Ellsworth. So, you know, we know that these compounds have been used in uh, firefighting, uh, firefighting foams. Um, I, I'm going to throw another acronym in here, poly and perfluoroalkyl substances, um, which really encompasses not just the PFAAs, but the polyfluoride uh, materials, the uh, I'll often use the term PFAA precursor, so uh, suspected um, uh, precursors to these compounds. And uh, the truth is, when we started this work, we knew that these things were out there uh, in the environment. Um, we knew that they were associated with these uh, firefighter activities, but we didn't really have a whole uh, lot of sense of what the relative composition of both AFFF uh, and uh, the, the, the compounds that are actually in uh, the environment at these AFFF impacted sites um, and we also didn't really understand their spatial distribution. And by the way, AFFF, aqueous film forming foam, short for the, the foams used to fight, uh, fight these, um, these fuel fires. Uh, and the, the big motivating question for us is that when these training uh, activities were going on, this is a nice uh, photo of a training activity on a cement pad. It was not that way back in the day. Um, as my father-in-law, a retired army general, would say, we'd basically throw stuff in a pit, anything that would burn, we'd light it, and then we'd put it out. Uh, and so there's a lot of stuff that was there that got into the subsurface. In fact, I would say our knowledge of these fire training areas uh, historically has not been focused on these fluorochemicals, but has been on the fuel hydrocarbons, the BTEX, and even chlorinated solvents. And what I can tell you is that over the last 20 to 30 years, we've been actually trying to remediate those sites for those other compounds. Okay? And so our, uh, one of the questions we wanted to ask is, have those activities, have those attempts to remediate the hydrocarbons or the chlorinated solvents or whatever else might be present at the site impacted uh, either the, the composition or the distribution of these compounds uh, in the subsurface, given that we suspect that they will uh, likely be there. 
So um, I'll throw some more uh, chemical structures uh, out here for you. Uh, these are a group of, uh, these are the perfluoroalkyl acids, carboxylates and sulfonates. So they only differ uh, in their head group and they, they have a variety of chain lengths. If I didn't mention that before, they can come in very short to very long uh, chain compounds. Uh, Fluorotelomer sulfonates uh, are similar, uh, except they are not fully fluorinated. So these would be a polyfluorinated material. Uh, and we knew that these compounds were out there, but um, more recently, uh, Jennifer Fields' group um, has been looking and identifying uh, PFA precursors, or PFAs, uh, more broadly, uh, in AFFF. Um, and so these are some of the structures that they uh, came up with with their um, various uh, mass spectrometry-based techniques. And what you'll see is uh, these fluorine perfluoroalkyl groups, okay? In some cases, connected to a sulfur and a nitrogen, other cases, a hydrocarbon spacer, uh, and so on. And uh, so these were all detected um, in either AFFF or in groundwater at AFFF impacted sites. And keep in mind that we are really interested in these two, comp these two classes of compounds because these are the ones that are environmentally persistent. Um, the, suspe the suspicion is that these compounds will degrade uh, to form these. And there are actual studies ongoing to look at the transformation of these compounds to these uh, perfluoroalkyl acids. Um, so we wanted to understand these compounds uh, at our site, but we, getting analytical standards for a lot of these compounds is very difficult. Uh, in fact, if not uh, impossible. And even if you, uh, when they were, uh, even when Jennifer Fields' group was able to um, uh, infer what the concentrations were of these compounds, uh, they weren't able to account for everything uh, that was in the environmental samples using a, di a different approach, which I'll, which I'll hit on. Uh, so we kind of decided to go around looking at chemical-specific data for a lot of these precursors and instead use uh, what's called the, the top assay. Um, and the idea between the, the top assay, uh, and I'm going to fully credit David Sedlak for, for developing this, it was pretty ingenious, is you take these polyfluorinated ma materials, whether they're sulfonate or carboxylate precursors, so they have these perfluoroalkyl components to them, and you subject it to a uh, hydroxyl radical. And it's under uh, persulfate, high pH, high temperature conditions. And what happens is the hydroxyl radical chews up the non-fluorinated portion of the molecule, and you produce uh, perfluoroalkyl acids. Even if you have a sulfonate precursor, you produce these perfluoroalkyl acids, uh, the, the carboxylates, I should say. Um, and it turns out you generate um, not just um, a straight conversion of a C8 based uh, molecule to a C8 uh, based uh, carboxylate, you end up generating some shorter chain compounds uh, because of, of the reaction. But what this enables you to do is if you, even if you don't know what those uh, precursors are in your sample, you can apply this assay and get some sense of the potential for uh, PFAA formation, if you will, uh, in the subsurface if these precursors are indeed present. Uh, so uh, using uh, the top assay, uh, this is just a quick example of, of how it's used. Um, again, from Jennifer Fields. Uh, actually, this is Erica, Sed uh, Erica Houts' work uh, at, with David Sedlak, um, but working with Jennifer. Um, they basically took some various formations of uh, AFFF uh, from various manufacturers. And if um, you analyze the sample untreated, essentially, so just straight up analysis. Uh, and by the way, most of this analysis is done by LC tandem mass spectrometry. I won't get into that today. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but you take these, these uh, AFFF uh, formulations and you oxidize them uh, and you generate all of these carboxylates. So they were basically very, very low levels. And in fact, I would almost say very, very little to no carboxylates in some of these formulations. But once you oxidize a sample, you generate a very large suite at fairly high concentrations of these perfluor carboxylates. And even uh, the 3M formulations, uh, which primarily were, were PFOS based, there were some uh, uh, sulfonamide, presumably, uh, precursors that generated things like the C6 acid uh, upon oxidation. Uh, and so again, this is a, a way of trying to characterize what these precursors might be, even if you don't know um, exactly what they are. This is an example of applying that uh, assay to uh, samples actually taken from Ellsworth, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, these are kind of uh, representative AFFF um, composition. So fluorotelomer-based uh, uh, precursors, sulfonamide, and here would be the, um, the uh, primarily PFOS, I believe, here. Uh, and if you go out and look in the environment, uh, you see some of these same uh, compounds, 
But this white bar are these unidentified precursors. Okay, so these are things we don't have standards for, and we can't actually account for based off uh, the things that we can directly measure. So we have to infer their presence using this, this uh, total oxidizable precursor assay. So um, what, when we think about these fire training areas, you know, uh, we can think about what we might expect uh, to be true about these sites. Uh, first of all, we expect that these compounds are going to be present uh, 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 in and around these historical fuel plumes. And in fact, the Air Force, uh, to my knowledge, has actually stopped testing their fire training areas because every single time they go out, they find these compounds. And so they're like, let's not waste the effort. They're there. Um, and we, we expect that depending on what has happened to the site, there, uh, there would likely be some conversion, maybe not complete, but some conversion of these presumed precursors to our perfluoroalkyl alkyl acids. And uh, our initial hypothesis was that depending on the re release scenario, uh, and I, sh I should mention these fire training areas, uh, their release was basically over um, you know, weekly exercises over many years, many decades often, uh, and so it was kind of a continual release scenario. Um, we would expect some differential transport of these uh, perfluoroalkyl acids. And I won't go into it, but uh, the, the short story is the longer the fluorochemical, uh, the longer it takes for it to move through the subsurface. Okay? There's a little bit of an exception to that at the very short chain compounds, but we expect the shorter chain compounds to basically move much more quickly uh, through the subsurface. So uh, getting into our, our field study in terms of what we did, we went out to Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota, uh, and we were looking at uh, OU1, for anyone who's familiar with uh, um, uh, Superfund site designations, this is Operational Unit 1. Uh, it was a berm pit uh, in 1942 to 1990, so almost 50 years of, of application, not necessarily of AFFF over that entire time. Uh, but previous investigations had found VOCs, uh, semi-volatiles, pesticides, chlorinated solvents, you name it. Basically, it was any sort of waste they could burn was put in this pit uh, and, and put on uh, lit and then put out using this uh, material. Um, remediation occurred over a number of years. They actually stopped in 2011. Uh, they had a lot of pump and treat. Uh, when I talked to the base manager, he's surprised that anything was left in the groundwater given that they'd been pumping so much of it out. Um, and, and importantly, they had these oxygen infusion wells. They were basically trying to, they are doing biosparging. They were trying to stimulate the subsurface to uh, microbially transform some of these hydrocarbons, which are uh, subjective, are subject to oxidative transformation. And they were trying to encourage that in the subsurface. So uh, a little bit more on the site. The, it's about five meters uh, to groundwater at the site. Um, clay loam, uh, sandy loam, so uh, not, not hugely uh, hydro not a high hydraulic conductivity, but, but enough. Um, and again, this idea of that the site had been extended, uh, there had been fairly extensive pump and treat uh, and biosparging. And this is a zoom in on the site. This is the historical, or actually, as of 2002, the, the benzene plume, uh, and then the plume extent in 2011, showing that they had been shrinking the plume uh, over time, partially due to natural attenuation, partially due to uh, the various activities. And this is the, the groundwater direction is flowing this direction. Uh, and that red circle, I'll try and keep that as the, the area where the burn pit actually was. So we went out there uh, in two sampling campaigns in 2011 and 2012 uh, and uh, put in some temporary monitoring wells, uh, tried to get groundwater. I think we got it from most of them. Uh, got some surface and subsurface soils, uh, surface soils and aquifer solids. And then we went back out and did a little bit more analysis, uh, getting uh, groundwater from existing monitoring wells. It was fairly well um, uh, instrumented in terms of monitoring wells and a lot of different surface soils. We analyzed them for fluorochemicals uh, at CSM, the, the perfluoroalkyl acids, um, and then uh, we looked for known AFFF components or suspected transformation products, and that work was actually done at UC Berkeley, and then also they, they analyzed all of the samples, or the, the groundwater samples, I'm sorry, with the top assay uh, at UC Berkeley. And then we did some spatial analysis um, to try and understand where these things were, were at. And just jumping kind of straight into the data, we generated lots of these fun maps. Um, so this is actually published, and the SI is kind of a fun read because it's got lots of these colorful maps in it. Um, but this is a surface soil uh, contamination. And what you can see is that around the burn pit, which is you know, right in here, uh, looking at the C6 acid, the C8 acid, the C8 sulfonate, um, relatively high concentrations. Um, and I, in fact, I think this is exceeding the soil screening reference value for PFOS, which is around 
16,000 micrograms per kilogram, I think, um, in and around the burn pit. Uh, but this was really no surprise. We knew that the soils were going to be fairly high in concentration for these compounds. So what happened uh, is we looked at the surface soils. We then uh, went and looked in the groundwater. And this is where things started to get a little bit interesting. Uh, so uh, again, here's a burn pit. Groundwater flow is in this direction. So it makes sense that the plume is moving uh, down gradient. Uh, and again, the C6 acid, C8 acid, and perfluoroctane sulfonate. And you might notice something uh, right away. Um, Things, one is not like the other, okay? Um, but one thing that we particularly noticed is the fact that, uh, again, we expected there to be some differential transport. The C6 acid moves much more rapidly, or should move more rapidly through the subsurface as compared to the C8 acid. And there was really no difference in terms of the plumes uh, for these two compounds. The other thing is PFOS. Um, this is not the same. It's not the same spatial distribution. So we're like, why is PFOS really hot over on this side when this is kind of the main uh, 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 hydrocarbon plume? And clearly, for a lot of the perfluoroalkyl acids, the, particularly the carboxylates, this was the, the main plume. Um, so uh, just to show you that uh, what we thought was likely going to happen, uh, kind of the, the sense of what we would uh, expect to happen based on the differential transport, we did a little bit of hydrous modeling, showing the C6 and the C8. And this is, uh, a, this is t uh, 47 years. We ran, ran it for 47 years, basically 25 years of application, followed by 22 years of uh, things just kind of migrating the subsurface, making a lot of assumptions about the, the homogeneity of the subsurface, et cetera. But the short story is, you know, you can tell, you should see some differential transport of these compounds based on what we know about their absorption potential. So that suggested that if the fact that these were co-located maybe the releases were actually still ongoing. In fact, there wasn't, uh, if, I, if I kept at T equals 25 years, I actually got, um, so, you know, I turned off the, the source. The image looks very similar, if you will, uh, to what we actually observed. So that implied that maybe there's some sort of continual release of these compounds uh, to the subsurface. The other thing is, is kind of trying to understand what's up with, with PFOS, all right? And so we, we were saying, well, we saw this big plume off to the east, um, not in the main area. Is, did we miss something in the surface soil? Maybe they were washing the trucks out over on this side and, and everything was, there was a lot more PFOS for some reason and when they washed it and there was a lot more getting in the subsurface there. Well, if you look at our, our groundwater map here, uh, high, high, uh, highlighting um, the area where we had uh, the higher levels, that's the same area highlighted on this plot, which is the surface soil. There was no surface soil signal, if you will, or at least not the same signal that we saw um, in the groundwater. So we basically thought, well, we probably, probably did not have an initial surface source. So then the question became, well, maybe we altered what was in the groundwater by pumping, okay? And so we looked at where um, the, the pumps, the pumping went on, and that actually has some plausibility in that most of the extraction wells are down here. In fact, this is the area where they were pumping most of the water out and there was very little pumping going on uh, in and around this eastern side. So that actually had um, some, some plausibility to it, that maybe they were pumping a lot of the PFOS out of the ground, and the fact that it was hot over here was because they weren't pumping that water out of the ground. But then that raises the question, why did we have these short-chain uh, perfluoroalkyl acids, the carboxylates, in the main plume, if we know that those compounds actually absorb a lot less strongly than PFOS. PFOS is probably the most sorptive of the compounds that we were looking at. If, if they were pumping things out of the groundwater, why would you still have those in the groundwater if, um, if you were, had, uh, had pumped all the PFOS away? Uh, and, and the short answer to that is precursors, okay? Uh, so when we took our groundwater samples and we subjected them to the top analysis, um, this is the sum of all of those uh, precursors that were generated in terms of molar equivalents. And what you can see is you see a, 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 um, a plot, if you will, that's very similar to our PFOS, where the, there's a pretty big hot spot over here to the east of the, of the plume. And we suspect, and I'll, I'll show you the data a little bit later on, that these compounds, these precursors, are a lot less mobile uh, than the, the alkyl acids themselves. And in fact, when we were able to measure certain specific precursors, so these are outside of the top analysis, we could directly measure this fluorohexane sulfonamide, um, which is presumed to transform to the, um, uh, the uh, perfluorohexane sulfonate 
uh, via microbial processes, um, that that was also slightly elevated again on the eastern side of this plume. And so all of this is pointing to the fact that there's been something going on uh, with conversion of these compounds, these precursors, uh, that is, has, has probably already occurred in the main plume, uh, but has not occurred over here, where again, this side, the eastern side, is where there's been very little remedial activity. And just another line of evidence for that is that if you look at a chemical signature of the AFFF, um, based off Jennifer Field's work, uh, at least, the hexane sulfonate to octane sulfonate ratio in AFFF uh, is typically about 0.1, or based at least on the ones that, um, that she looked at. And so if you have that present and you release uh, these compounds, you would expect, because hexane sulfonate is going to travel more rapidly, that ratio will increase continually as the plume moves down gradient. Okay, so the, the hexane sulfonate will travel more quickly, and you'll get an elevated ratio compared to PFOS as you move down gradient. Now, the, the other thing, though, is that there are these hexane sulfonate precursors um, in AFFF. And so uh, what we found when we went out and looked is we saw an increase in the ratio down gradient and then a decrease. And we saw this interesting pattern where the, there was this area where the, thing, the ratio was really high. In fact, it got up to about 50 to 1. Um, and it turns out that, that is half those, those, um, those ratios were elevated exactly where they were pumping oxygen in the subsurface. Okay? And so these were their biosparging wells. And so what we think this is pretty strong evidence that you were converting uh, by stimulating aerobic biotransformation processes these six C6 precursors to the C6 sulfonate in situ. And that would completely ex uh, explain these ratios. It would also jive with what we're seeing in terms of the high levels of the shorter chain carboxylates uh, in the main plume, uh, because those are not those are arising from the continual transformation of these precursors in the subsurface. Um, so, uh, what that really told us is that um, there's a pretty significant impact of remediation technologies on the composition and the spatial distribution of these compounds uh, in the subsurface. And what the, the kind of take home message I got was that this eastern source zone where we had elevated PFOS and elevated precursors might be actually more representative of what the site looked like before remediation uh, was kicked in, in terms of uh, either pump and treat uh, and, and uh, bio, um, biosparging. And it also implies that that main fluorochemical plume, um, in, in terms of the short chain acids being present in that main plume, was a primarily a result of the biotransformation of these precursors uh, in the subsurface, which is actually a, a pretty important uh, finding in that to the extent we don't know or don't look for these precursors out there in samples, it's, it's under predicting the levels of some of these shorter chain uh, perfluorocarboxylates that might be out there. So just jumping in uh, briefly into to some of the lab studies that, uh, that we did to kind of follow up on this, um, this was motivated by the fact that we had, had these maps, we, had, we could make some assumptions about um, the, the concentrations, the, the depth to groundwater, uh, how one, we, I mean, it was, it was very back of the envelope calculations because we only had a few samples uh, as we went down um, with the temporary monitoring wells. Um, but we basically tried to estimate the mass of the compounds uh, that were associated either with the surface soils to the top a uh, few feet of soil, the subsurface uh, um, uh, soil and the aquifer solids, and then the groundwater. And what we uh, concluded based off this uh, kind of preliminary analysis was that um, even for PFOS, um, well, actually, PFOS, the most sorptive, we, we accounted 0% was in groundwater. Basically, most of the mass should be associated with uh, the solid phases, and even for uh, the short-chain acids, only 10 to 15% of the compound was actually uh, in the groundwater. So if we were only going to study groundwater, that would completely miss the mass of the compounds in the, in the soils. Uh, and it further suggested that understanding the release of these compounds from the soils uh, was an important thing to do. So what we did was we wanted to see how quickly these compounds desorbed from the materials. So we took some uh, field collected solids, uh, mostly from Ellsworth. We had one sample from uh, Scott Air Force Base. And we did these infinite sink desorption experiments, which I, I, I'm guessing some folks might be familiar with. The basic idea is you take soil, you add water, you shake it up really well. After 24 hours, you centrifuge and decant that water. You measure the level of the, in the water, and you replace it. And you repeat that 
uh, and you basically try and desorb everything you can uh, from that soil. And we not only measured what was coming off in the water phase for the fluorochemicals, but we also subjected it to the top assay. So basically, how fast do the chemicals come off? How fast do the precursors come off? Um, and then we, uh, we, we eventually tried to fit the data with some uh, desorption models, which I'll show in a moment. But this is just a quick example of the total mass we observed the desorb. So this is cumulative. We add up what gets desorbed with each step over 14 days. Um, and this is the PFOA coming off. This is the PFOA plus the delta PFOA. So that's the PFOA that was formed from the oxidation of a PFOA precursor. Okay? So what this is telling you, at least for this soil, and it wasn't the same necessarily for all soils. Some had higher levels of these precursors. Others didn't. We not only have a lot of the mass coming off as this precursor, but it is also coming off more slowly. Okay? And this is more better illustrated in this figure, uh, showing all the different soils. Uh, just representative uh, PFOA, the hexane sulfonate, and the octane sulfonate. And you see, and this is now kind of inverted. Uh, it wasn't total mass coming off, but rather the fraction remaining uh, on the solid phase. And we see fairly rapid desorption of PFOA. The hexane sulfonate also fairly rapid. PFOS, I mentioned, is one of the more absorptive and more slowly moving. It desorbs more slowly than the others. Um, and then if we look at our, our deltas, so again, this is the measure of the formation potential for these compounds. So it's an indirect measurement of a chemical. It's not a specific chemical being measured. Um, we see generally see slower desorption uh, of the either C5, C7, or C8, or C6 uh, precursors. And so what we did was we took these, these fitted rate constants. We, did, we tried to fit them all with a, um, a one compartment desorption model for the acids. And for, the, for these guys, it actually worked fairly well. Uh, for these deltas, um, it didn't actually work that well. We had to do a two compartment model. Uh, and so these are the desorption rate constants that we obtained from the different soils. There's a lot of scatter here. Um, I'll just uh, say that right up front. Um, but for the carboxylates, you did see a little bit of a trend of um, decreasing um, uh, desorption rate constant with increasing chain length. For the sulfonates, it's actually very strong. It's a nice, clear, linear relationship. Um, but I, as I uh, alluded to, there is some interesting desorption behavior going on with these short chain carboxylates. Um, but the other thing you'll notice is that the closed symbols are the, the fast fraction. These open symbols down here are the, the slow compartment. So essentially, we had to fit with both a fast and slowly desorbing component. And uh, the precursors, in general, desorb more slowly. And we sometimes had to use a two-compartment model to model their desorption, uh, which, um, again, kind of infer, goes back to that, those, the first gut reaction when you look at that figure. They're coming off the soils much more slowly. Um, these, yes? These different samples, are they different types of soils? Uh, they are different soil samples. Yeah, so they're different types. They're different. We tried to actually understand what's controlling the kinetics, and we just didn't have enough, uh, enough samples to really get at it. The other interesting thing that I really won't talk on too much more is uh, we saw this very unique thing with this hexane, the hexanoic acid. Um, and we're fairly convinced based off mass balance issues uh, and the fact that this is more in line with what we're observing over here, that um, we're seeing some sort of abiotic transformation uh, in our desorption tests of uh, C6 precursor to uh, the C6 acid. Even though we've, we've got sodium azide in these systems, uh, there's something going on that's converting uh, some of these precursors even um, in the absence of, of biology. So uh, kind of what we learned from this was that these precursors uh, did desorb uh, more slowly than the acids. Um, it wasn't huge differences, but, it, but it, there was a difference. Um, and uh, the, most of the compounds, with the exception of PFOS, do actually desorb fairly quickly. Uh, so that if something's going to stick around, uh, it's probably going to be one of these precursors that's going to stick around and, and be this potential con continual source uh, to the subsurface of these, particularly these short chain uh, perfluorocarboxylates. So we have this ongoing question of whether or not remediation activities can actually hasten uh, or slow, uh, uh, knowing kind of some of the work that is planned here uh, with folks trying to, to, to prevent the migration of these compounds, uh, the desorption of, of these PFAAs and or the precursors. And to, to, to look at that, we first wanted to say, um, we don't even know how uh, the, the remediation activities impact the transport of the compounds themselves, the, the, ac the acids, the perfluoroalkyl acids. Uh, and the, the remediation uh, that we're particularly interested in is this uh, in situ chemical oxidation. Uh, and this is one of the 
chemical approaches to trying to remediate these hydrocarbon plumes. The idea is you basically pour in high levels of persulfate, permanganate, or hydrogen peroxide uh, into the subsurface, oxidize the heck out of everything, uh, and hope that your TCE or BTEX or whatever goes away. So to answer uh, this first question, trying to understand the impacts on just the PFAAs, not so much the precursors yet, we're, we're getting to that in the next year or so, uh, we did some column experiments uh, with these uh, chemical oxidants. So we, we ran columns packed with uh, clean soil, so this was not field soil. Uh, we ran artificial groundwater with our fluorochemicals in an upflow mode um, under relatively high uh, flow rates, uh, and then we added oxidants. And this was kind of our schematic where we, um, the, the, the purple line is when we added fluorochemicals in the influent, uh, so we loaded and then we stopped and then we loaded again. We did a second little pulse, if you will, uh, and this is relative poor volumes. It's, it's more for illustrative purposes. Um, and then we added chemical oxidants first as a pulse uh, and then an extended oxidation period. And this is kind of what we were thinking might happen. We could either uh, release some of these compounds when we added the chemical oxidants or maybe we would absorb the compounds more strongly and we see this drop. We weren't really sure what to expect. And then we would, on the, the extended oxidation, we expected something similar. We'd either release more or hold more um, when we added uh, the compounds. So what we actually did um, uh, when we ran the uh, experiments is we observed something like this. And this is an example for, for PFOS in these columns. And you've got the, the no oxidant control. There's a lot of noise here. These columns are, are tricky in that uh, there's a lot of variability even when you do replicate columns and average them out. Um, but we, we see uh, the kind of the tip, the blue, the light blue, the, the typical breakthrough, desorption, and the second uh, um, set of pore volumes coming off there. When we added uh, persulfate, that's the one we actually observed the biggest effect. We saw, as soon as we added the pulse oxidant, a drop in the effluent levels for PFOS. And for permanganate and catalyzed hydrogen peroxide, again, two other chemical oxidants typically added, we tended to see minimal effect in some cases, and then more of an effect uh, and then differential breakthrough over here. And I'll get to this, this thing in a moment. But zooming in first in the, the orange slide, or the orange section, what we wanted to do first was kind of get a qualitative sense of what is happening with the chemicals when we add these oxidants. And so we kind of scored them uh, based off uh, whether or not we saw a dip or not. Um, the first thing I'll say is we didn't see any release, we didn't see any increase in concentration uh, when we added the oxidants. Um, and I, I should mention we also ran these columns with and without TCE, given that uh, these technologies are typically employed for degrading TCE in the subsurface. And what you see is that, um, you know, we scoring them based on no effect, a small dip, the, the system recovered, a large dip, the system recovered, or a large dip with no real recovery. Recovery being the compound coming back up and getting to full breakthrough, C over C naught of one. Uh, and what we observed is that the perangate catalyzed hyd hydrogen peroxide not any huge effects there of having it, but the persulfate, we saw a pretty big effect. And I'll mention that there is some literature out there to suggest that when you have persulfate radical, it can actually degrade these compounds, all right? So we're thinking, did we actually, um, did we actually degrade these compounds? And the short story is no, <laughs> we didn't, unfortunately. Uh, if we integrate the mass that came off the column uh, and, and compare that to what we added in, we tend to see pretty close to 100% recovery. Um, given the, the long time we were running that, we thought that was pretty good, with a few exceptions. Uh, and those are here, the C10, C11 carboxylates, a very low recovery in the case of persulfate. And this is shown for TCE. The non-TCE systems were similar. And PFOS, again, slightly uh, low re lower recovery um, when we had persulfate in the system. And so just kind of going back uh, to this plot, this is the same data shown slightly differently. This is our, uh, our prototypical uh, kind of uh, experimental design where we had the pulse oxidant, the extended oxidation, uh, and the second, um, uh, second pulse of the chemicals. We see PFOS going down, and what happened, basically, our mass balance was poor because we didn't run the experiment long enough. Um, we, I mean, LC mass spec, if anyone who does that, it's not something you can do right, uh, right away, even if we do things as quickly as we can. It usually takes a couple days. And we ran the experiment. We thought, oh, everything should be back to normal. Uh, we'll stop collecting samples. But uh, if we had kept collecting samples, we think we could have gotten the rest of this peak. So we think, essentially, 
we, we desorbed the compounds and they just were desorbing so much more slowly when the persulfate was there um, that we, if we had run the experiment longer, we would have been able to recover them. Why do we think that they were absorbed more strongly? Well, um, we're, we're following this up with some additional work, but we think it was primarily a pH issue. So the difference between permanganate, persulfate, and hydrogen peroxide is that the other two typically don't alter the pH in your system too much. So this is the pH over the course of the experiments. Persulfate, however, tends to lead to very low acidic conditions. Uh, so we went from pH 6 down to uh, pH 2 when we had a lot of persulfate going through the system. And we know that the pH does affect the absorption of these compounds. They absorb much more strongly uh, to materials when there is a, a low pH in the system. And so what we think is happening is we're essentially dropping the pH, they're absorbing more strongly, and the reason they were slowly coming back off is because the pH was slowly rising. Uh, and if we had waited until the pH had gotten back to our initial conditions, we probably would have actually recovered all of the PFOS uh, that was in the system. So, what did we kind of conclude from all of, the, all of this complicated chemistry and, and transport experience, or, uh, experiments? Well, what I would say is that we think that uh, these precursors, these PFAA precursors, um, which you could classify as these polyfluorinated compounds, are pretty important uh, at these AFFF impacted sites. Um, and I think we have some fairly strong evidence that uh, we can alter both the composition and distribution of these compounds uh, depending on what uh, has been done in terms of remediating the site. Uh, and I, I didn't put a sub-bullet up there, but I would, I would make the comment that uh, just because you don't find uh, high levels of the short-chain perfluorocarboxylic acids does not mean that you will not in the future find high levels of these short-chain carboxylic acids because you have to actually look for these precursors. So I think the top assay is actually really easy to do and anyone doing these sorts of site characterization work, I would highly encourage you to try and pick that, up, that method up and, and use it because I think it is very, a uh, very informative method. Um, we found, uh, at least preliminarily, that these precursors as measured by the top assay, do desorb much more slowly um, than the, uh, the perfluorocarboxylates uh, and the sulfonates. And, and PFOS is the one that is kind of in between. It, it can desorb slowly or fairly quickly depending on, on the quality of the material. And we, uh, we haven't actually, uh, Matt, to get to your question earlier, we haven't actually been able to figure out why, why it is that, the, that PFOS is desorbing more slowly in some cases. Uh, and I think our initial conclusions is that at least as currently applied, uh, ISCO uh, is probably going to be fairly ineffective at degrading these uh, fluorochemicals, but uh, may alter the mobility of the compounds. And uh, what we're certainly going after next is understanding how much, uh, how effective ISCO is at converting these precursors to the perfluorocarboxylic acids, uh, which could be better or worse kind of depending on your perspective. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to say a thank you to the, the folks that funded the project. Uh, this was funded from CERDIP. We also had some Air Force money for the site characterization, a little bit of NSF money for uh, the students uh, at CSM. And if you're really interested in fluorochemicals, uh, I'll put a, a teaser out there. Uh, I am organizing a meeting next summer uh, all about fluorochemicals, uh, all you can drink, eat, uh, whatever fluorochemicals, for, for two days uh, in, in beautiful Golden, Colorado. So uh, I'd encourage you to, to be on the lookout for this. I should have an email out to folks about that relatively soon. So with that, I will take any questions. Thanks, Chris. And remember to wait for the microphone before you ask your question. Wondering if what your relationship with 3M on this was? Uh, I have uh, currently no formal relationship with 3M. Uh, we have been fortunate to get some standards from from 3M in the past, um, but uh, it's uh, it, I, we've I don't we haven't not worked with each other intentionally. But um, uh, this has been funded primarily from the Department of Defense. Most of this work. I was stationed at Ellsworth. Did you go up there and work? I was there in 51, 52. <laughs> well, I, I did go up there, not that during that time period. <laughs> uh, and you know, the, the surprising thing was, um, I forgot how cold it can be in October. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know, maybe you guys are all hardened here, but uh, from Colorado, 
uh, it, was, it was like, dang, this is cold. So actually, if you look at this photo uh, right here, these are my, my postdoc and my graduate student. We clearly did not quite dress for the, uh, the weather. They were pretty darn cold. Any other questions? Nope. I was wondering about the possibility that you are really dealing with, to a certain extent, solids, PFAA and PFAS solids, that would degrade slowly over time. And that could be the cause of some of your initial findings. Well, I would say that we're, we are fairly convinced that solids are important. Um, I don't think we've got pure phase solids, if that's what you're referring to. Um, this is, the, the reason for that is they actually dug up the burn pit. So the original burn pit was excavated and hauled off because it was just, it was, uh, I think the levels of napples and denapples were just out of this roof, um, or out of the roof. And so they dug it up and they took it off, they hauled it off. Um, so any pure phase solid that was left from the initial application and evaporation, I think was gone. This was the stuff that had been mobilized. Based off the, the water that was applied, it had been leached in the subsurface. And I didn't show the, the, subs, the subsurface solid plumes, but they kind of match exactly what we saw in the groundwater in terms of spatial distribution. So they're, we do think they're associated with the solids, but we don't think they're necessarily the, the, the pure solid phase materials. So. Uh, so I was wondering with respect to these things, there's really nothing you can do. Is that correct? You just have to dig them up and bury them? Is that the only option? Uh, <laughs> I think there are some promising technologies out there. Um, right. So uh, there's been a number of, there's a, a paper actually in ESNT letters, not that long ago, you, maybe you handled it, um, on a catalyzed hydrogen peroxide process. And basically uh, it's suggested that hydroxyl radical won't degrade these compounds. But if you can get things like superoxide uh, radical, and I'm trying to remember the other species, that maybe they will degrade them uh, slowly. Uh, but I, I, I believe the, 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 state, the best state of the art for actually degrading them right now is burning them. Uh, I, Gary, or, or you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that's what my understanding is. If you really want to degrade them and not just remove them from the aqueous phase, um, it, the best thing is to burn them. Uh, th I don't think there are any. I don't think there are any remediations. At least for AFFF impacted sites, there are any remediation plans in place. I'm sure there are some other activities at industrially impacted sites, etc. Um, I will. I mean, I, I, what is it? Is it Oakdale that has the carbon, the GAC system that's actually really well, uh, really good at removing these compounds? Um, but you do have to make sure you change the carbon on a regular basis because they will break through. Um, so. And then regeneration will be a high temperature. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will tell you that um, there's been an interest. If you look at just water treatment side, there's, um, there's the, the GAC approach. There's also um, ion exchange resins. But the problem that has, my understanding with, the, with ion exchange resins is once they, they absorb the ion exchange resin, you can't get them back off. So it's, it's really hard to regenerate. You can't basically can't. It's a one pass uh, ion exchange resin use. Yeah. Um, for the one experiment where the pH like got really messed up with the um, persulfonate, mm -hmm. do you have any like plans or intentions to go back and like retry that experiment with like a tighter pH control or, or like even buffered system to see if that would actually? And if you do that, what would you expect to be any different, or would you expect the results to be pretty much the same as the other ones because those are pretty consistent? Um, we thought about doing that. Um, we thought about running a column just with water at pH 2 uh, without the oxidants. Um, and uh, it's just, we don't, we're not sure that that would actually help uh, all that much because we're pretty confident when we lower pH in a batch system, we see much stronger absorption. And, and it's in the right order of magnitude in terms of the retardation that we observed. It's very hard to model these sorts of complicated uh, scenarios, but we were, we were trying we're trying to do an, uh, to have some sort of understanding of uh, what might happen under a typical real-world scenario, as opposed to really get at the mechanism. But I think that the batch data that we have um, fully supports the idea that the pH effect is 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 dropping 
uh, is, is increasing the absorption and dropping the concentration down to, to what we observed. <laughs> so it <clears throat> in your oxidant added system, you not only change the absorption of a lot of those compounds, but you change the desorption. They came off mm -hmm. at a different rate. So is it plausible that you're actually affecting the sorbent more so than the sorbate? Absolutely. Actually, I would say um, the pH effect was more of a change in the sorbent material. Uh, and it's, that's one of those things we'd love to follow up on, and I'm not sure how we're going to do it. Uh, but um, we're, we're fairly confident that that is, um, is exactly what's happening. And maybe the slower desorption was also the fact that the compounds were adsorbed in the organic matter in the soil. We then oxidized the heck out of it, and we're kind of trapping it in there. And so it's diffusing a lot more slowly because of that. Um, but yeah, that's, um, the, the point of this was, was to show that we can have an impact. Actually, mechanistically explaining that, that's the next grant, right? Do you, can you pull up one of your contour maps from the first half, I guess? Sure. What, what, what you soil, think? groundwater? Yeah, I, I, either. The groundwater is what I was thinking. Okay. The soil would do as well. Uh, any of those. Yep. Okay, there no, you go. Groundwater. Okay, my, 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 my question is, in the second half, you gave us some, a whole bunch of things to think about that I'm not sure how they're all interacting. Okay. How many observation wells, points were you actually drawing, let's say, groundwater out? I, I don't see them there. They're the light blue dots, so they ah. don't show up so well here. Sorry. Right. Um, okay. But um, it's on the order of between 35 and 40, I want to say, so groundwater wells. You wouldn't be able to see many of the complicated mechanisms in the field. Oh, no. no absolutely not. And, in fact, you've smeared a lot of stuff there. In, in, in terms of like that tail, that whole purple tail down there is based on one observation? Yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not trying to interpret what's going on down here, to be honest. Yeah, We're understand. really trying to focus on what's going on up, up in the, the okay. main plume area. Thank you. Um, but you, you raised an excellent point that, you know, field, I, this is my first foray into field work. Uh, and um, I was fortunate to work with people who knew a little bit more about field work than I did. And uh, I think you can't, tell as conclusive a story as you would want. Um, but I think everything that I was trying to convey here is, is we, we tried to find multiple lines of evidence uh, to support what we think was going on in terms of conversion. And it, it very much jives with some of the research that's yet to be published related to the transformation of these compounds. I'm going to take the last question. Sure. So there was a consulting firm that was really pushing ISCO for treating chlorinated solvents, and there was a firm that was pushing, putting molasses in to do reductive chlorination. The molasses firm bought the ISCO firm. <laughs> but would this argue that because you could potentially generate a new plume of perfluorochemicals in these systems that you should do reductive dechlorination for the TCE? If at, least, at least then you wouldn't oxidize the precursors. You're not going to get rid of your perfluoros, but... It depends on your objective. Um, so David Sedlak's approach for developing this oxidation assay was one as an analytical tool. But you could, you could also argue that if you're really trying to flush everything out of the subsurface, then do ISCO. Convert all the precursors uh, and convert everything to the acids. They're mo more mobile, and you can flush them out of the system. Now, uh, an interesting minor com uh, comment related to your, your comment about the adding molasses and reductive dechlorination. Um, I almost thought about using this as an educational exercise and, uh, and you know, give the hypothetical situation that you have a, a, a consulting firm coming in, they give you a map and they have this plume and they say, look, we see more PFOA on the outside of the plume and no PFOA in the middle of the plume. Uh, their first, so the idea is, you know, you see a ring of PFOA around where the, the BTEX plume was. And um, maybe they, th they know that there's reductive dechlorination or reducing conditions in the middle of the plume. And the first assumption would be, oh, something is reducing the, the fluorochemicals and degrading them. And I would say, actually, that's completely the opposite. It's the fact that the oxidative conditions on the outside of the plume are actually leading to the production of the acids. And the reason that you don't have the acids in the middle is because they're not, it, because it is reducing conditions. Um, but yeah, I, it's whether or not you want to generate these precursors or not, uh, that's a good question. It's going to happen on its own uh, to some extent, but you know, the rate of transformation in this part of the, 
Plume, I think, is more representative of typical conditions as opposed to managed conditions where you're trying to stimulate activity. So. Okay, let's thank Chris once more.